Hi, everyone. So my name is Luis, and I previously co-founded Aragon, which is the largest platform for decentralized autonomous organization, helping these communities govern more than $20 billion in other center management. And the first time I came through, um, uh, through Bitcoin, I thought, oh, we have sovereign money. Then I went down to uh, co-found Aragon, um, and then we have sovereign organizations. And now I am working on the next step, uh, which is kind of like sovereign individuals, and so allowing everyone to be a sovereign individual. So I'm going to talk about sovereignty through citizenship, and basically why you should add a passport or see a passport as part of your uh, sovereignty stack. So basically what we're doing at Baseflow, uh, the company that I'm working on now, is we are creating the smoothest way to get a second passport. And so I'm going to come into uh, in a minute in um, how and which countries uh, welcome people like, like you that are talented uh, and, and that want to be part of these forward-looking countries. But let's go into a bit of the perks of having these multiple passports. So first of all, um, you have access to your opportunities. Uh, you can live new places. You can go to conferences like this one. Uh, you can you know, go to the Caribbean for some tourism and leisure. Uh, and also family re reunification, which has been quite important in COVID times, because uh, I mean, there were so many drama, uh, dramatic stories of people just getting separated because of different passports, nationalities, families were broken, relationships that might have happened never happened, um, all because of passports and, uh, and not having enough of them. There are multiple risks of having just one passport, and so one of them is loss of mobility. We don't think about this often. For example, I'm a Spaniard, and now the Spanish passport is great, but we don't know 20 years from now or 10 years from now, these things do change. Back in the day, people from Spain were going to Venezuela to work uh, and to Argentina because they were prosperous, uh, prosperous countries. Now it's exactly the opposite in only like a few decades. So these things do change. Then you have exit taxes. So some countries treat you like cattle, and when you want to leave, well, you got to pay a price. So that's also a big problem. You have military mobilization, which I included here because um, I, I know firsthand having some uh, Ukrainian family that it happens. And so some, some friends of, uh, of some of my family um, were only not uh, you know, living in bunkers for some time, but also had to suddenly you know, uh, go, to, go to war. And, and, and it happens. These things do happen. And the other thing is worldwide taxation, which I'll go into, into it a little bit. But yeah, again, some countries treating citizenships like cattle instead of customers. So basically, like, you, you don't want to have all your eggs in the same basket, especially if you are into crypto, uh, if you're into sovereign money, if you're into sovereignty. We are all quite paranoid. We want to live our life. We don't want anyone to disturb us. We want to do our thing, have our ventures, our family, um, you know, build your wealth over time. And the truth is, right now, the changes in macro policy can make this quite challenging. And um, basically, you can actually rank passports. So you can think of this as like the, the coin market cap uh, or coin geco of, of passports. And so this is based on like mobility, so how many countries you can travel to, political stability of the country, obviously no worldwide taxation. That's why the US passport is not as great as it might seem to some. Uh, and obviously, family or children rights. Can, you, can your children actually inherit this passport, um, so to say? So for example, what do the US and Eritrea have in common? While the different countries, well, these two countries do, uh, do tax you worldwide. So even if you go to like, you know, the UK and have a different non-DOM regime in which you can pay less taxes during 10, 15 years, you know, they don't care. You're going to still pay taxes to the US. Um, and, and that's quite mind-blowing. But and again, it does happen. The US is quite an important country in the world. So who tells us that tomorrow we're not going to have other countries follow suit and start doing the same? So basically, if you want to acquire new citizenship, um, if you're already, as I say, the platform is quite hard. So basically, what I'm trying to say is, if you're stateless, you cannot, you know, it's quite kind of hard to get a new citizenship. Um, but if, if, even if you have a citizenship of a country today, it's still quite hard because it's a very bureaucratic process, really bureaucratic process. Here's like a form, well, not a form, but like a list of forms that you need to fill, and with PDFs and emails and WhatsApp, and then these documents get leaked on the internet because of like some not very like maybe best security practices, and then your home address gets leaked on the internet again, and then you have to move homes. You know, these things do happen. And also, renouncing citizenship is quite um, cumbersome as well. And sometimes it does incur in exit taxes. Uh, this, again, um, in, they have this in the US and uh, also in other countries, like European countries. And it's becoming more and more generalized that you have to pay exit taxes. Sometimes you even have to sell everything you have 
to realize the gains, pay the taxes, and then you figure out what to do with your assets later, but it's, it's quite, quite dramatic. So let's talk about citizenship versus residency. So uh, if you're a passport freak like me, I mean, that Swiss passport is a sexy passport. You just look at it. It's so beautiful. Um, and uh, I hope that we, we can have many passports more like this that pop up of countries that are appearing here today. And you know, they give you governance rights, so you can vote. Uh, they give you mobility if you're a resident. You might have some mobility, but if you have a passport, then you can just access countries visa-free all over the world. Um, the usually residency is easy to revoke, maybe on basis of employment or marriage or whatever. Citizenship is quite hard to revoke, and obviously family rights. Um, so you that like, usually don't pass down uh, or to your family like residency, but it is the case usually with citizenship. One interesting thing here is uh, the new models of citizenship. So you can think of citizenship in the old world and in the new world. And so basically, um, the, there's like by blood. And so basically, that means you know if your parents had a passport, then you probably have a passport or birthright. So basically, you were born in a country, you get a passport. The latter is much uh, more common in, in the new world. And so you can think about the US, Canada, um, and so forth that welcome a lot of migrants and then basically like that that was a way of welcoming migrants uh, As compared to like you only have a, a passport if you are like, you know, a descent of someone else that had a passport The interesting thing is uh, these new models that have popped up the last new decades and that is the citizens by investment So there are countries um, Like you know countries that are already kind of like recognized and well known and some of them are in quite nice places, like the Caribbean, which is, you know, uh, as we've explored today, beautiful, beautiful waters, crystalline waters, uh, very connected to the US and so forth. And so they welcome uh, foreign investors that want to be part of a citizen base. So for 100K, you, you can basically uh, get into, get a, you get to be a citizen of these countries. Um, 125K, you can start including your family. And this, again, is something that you pass down. So it's, you can think about it as something that, like, you know, some kind of like generational wealth that you pass down to your family. And I think this is very important, because in the sovereignty stack, as I was talking before, there is sovereign money, so that's cryptocurrencies. There is citizenships, so you can hedge your bets and kind of like be above these nation states. Um, there's companies, which you can have in different places in the world. Um, and then there is also residency. So ideally, you want to have all of these in different places all across the globe. Right now, this might seem that it can only apply to a very small percentage of the population. But I do believe that we're getting into a direction in which, you know, a few years, maybe decades from now, everyone just will look at this as their kind of like citizenship stack. And so maybe when you are 18 years old, you are starting to pick like, you know, uh, not only what you want to study and work on, uh, or maybe you don't want to study and you want to drop out or, and like join this new kind of like ways of ed education. Uh, but then you also might pick your country or countries even, and like where do you have your company, and where do you have your residency, and which passport are you going to pass down to your children, and so forth and so on. And this is very liberating because we are switching from like being cattle controlled by uh, you know some governments here and there to being something else that is like a little bit above above those and going where you are treated best and inviting these governments to actually treat you really well. And believe me, some governments do want to treat people, exactly people like us here that are like talented very well, and they are willing to do so. We just need to work with them, um, sometimes to create new cities, and sometimes to just move to, to these countries, or even create new states within these countries, as we've seen today. So basically, I would invite you all to think of passports as a mobility platform. Um, so it's not only something that is like an annoying piece of paper that you like carry around uh, and, and that sometimes is beautiful, like the Swiss one, but also it's a mobility platform. It does enable you to do things you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And we sometimes, again, think that nothing is going to change because we think about our country and the fact that it's been maybe great for the last 10 years, 20, but macro has changed very quickly right now, so it's really good to be prepared. So um, at Baseflow, we're streamlining this process uh, we are invite only right now, but if you scan this code, it will take you to a, a page that we built um, for this conference, and we'll try to basically just like uh, jam you through through some of the queue and, and get early access. The the last thing I was in Amsterdam for a work conference was actually 10 years ago, and it was called the Bitcoin Conference. And I remember Brian Armstrong was giving out Coinbase flyers. And I will say the vibe here today reminds me so much of that conference in 2013. And so I think 10 years from now, we're going to look back at this and be like, wow, that ignited a movement. So thank you so much.